All right, aloha, welcome. This is the honorary geographer session of the 120th AAG annual meeting. My name is Gary Langham, I'm the executive director of the AAG. And our journey to Hawaii uh, started two years ago uh, and it was guided with a commitment to be self-aware. Aware that we are guests of an indigenous host culture with a deep connection to their homeland, mindful of the responsibility to understand their history and their worldview, respectful of practices that honor their relationship to place and ancestors. And one of the customs that our Hawaiian colleagues have shared with us involves protocols meant to open space or initiate uh, an action with a sense of humility and transparent intention. And that last statement is something we have really leaned into as, as AAG and as geographers from around the world to try to come here uh, with that transparent intention and a spirit of reciprocity. A kahu, or honored keeper of cultural practice, is often called upon to facilitate this practice, uh, this, this process of reflection and expression of our resolve. Today we are delighted to have Kahu Blake Brutus Lebens join us to serve as an officiant for opening our ceremony. So I'd like, please join me in welcoming uh, Brutus. Aloha Kaku. Brutus is my Hawaiian name. Uh, thank you for having me here, Gary. Uh, aloha to all of you. Uh, so I want to explain what I'll be doing just so you're not lost in the wonderment of what is this dude doing. I'm going to begin by blowing the poo, the conch shell. This is something we do to start ceremony or to herald in the arrival of somebody important, uh, even to call people to gather. For me and my family, though, what we like to do when we blow the poo is we, we like to put people in our heart who've affected us in positive ways. Uh, as it pertains to whatever we're doing. So when the pool's blowing, if there's anybody in your heart or on your mind, whether they're just not physically with us today or whether they've left this earthly realm, if they've impacted your life's journey and especially your reasons why you do what you do, put them in your heart and ask them to be here and lend their aloha to you uh, through this week-long journey here in Hawaii. I'm gonna follow up the four conch shell blows within Oli called Oli Aloha. Uh, it's, it's just a really endearing chant. Uh, it's one that is used for welcoming. I know that many of you are not from here, and so I'm obviously using it to welcome you into this space, into Hawaii. But also, what I love about this chant is the way my kumus have uh, described it. It talks in the first line, o nauna i te hala. it talks about the fragrance of the hala plant. And... Have you ever had an experience where you're in a, like an air-conditioned room where there's no odd smells permeating, and then suddenly you get a waft of grandma's favorite flower or that cigar smoke that your uncle used to smoke or dad used to smoke, and you're like, nobody's smoking. <laughs> there's no flowers here. Yeah, This, uh, this chant kind of references those occasions when our loved ones visit us from beyond. Yeah? And it's just reassurances that we're on the right path, that we're always with somebody, we're never alone. And it's a simple way to just honor uh, those people and this place. Following the chant, I am gonna do a simple pikai. Pikai is a sprinkling, a sprinkling of water. Yesterday we got to do a very, uh, a little bit more intimate kind of a ceremony with the leadership of this organization. And I asked each of them to bring water, just a little bit of water, travel size, <laughs> from, uh, from spaces that they considered special or sacred to them. And it's, it was pretty amazing. We got water from all over the country, even from different parts of the world, uh, all combined here in this uh, umeke, in this bowl. And the pikai is a process of charging the water with energy, with intention, yeah, with the end result, the vision. And that sprinkling is something that we do to kind of um, 
combine everything together and just kind of enroll our environment into those ideas and those energies that we want to have proliferated during our time. And so there were some really beautiful sentiments of the idea of home being in a space that feels like home away from home, uh, having safety and the freedom to express and challenge ideas uh, in an academic environment. Uh, there was, what else did we have, Gary? Responsibility. Kuleana was the word this guy used, yeah, reciprocity. And it, so if you see me after this session, I'll be kind of sneaking around from door to door to all the rooms and just kind of like doing a quick peek hike kind of thing. Don't, don't freak out and don't mind me. Yeah, we're just going to make sure that all these spaces uh, uh, have been peak hike for you. So I'm going to begin by blowing the conch shell again. And, you know, if, if you feel moved, it does help sometimes. But feel free to close your eyes for this portion. And if you do close your eyes, just, just really take a few big, deep breaths. And just kind of allow your soul, allow yourself, your foundation, your core, your spirit to settle into a space of ceremony. And as you're breathing, just really start to feel the energy, see the faces of your loved ones, those mentors, those people who have guided you here. And just ask them to lend their aloha to you. Thank you so much. That was amazing. We have one more guest to invite up uh, before we get to the main event. Uh, not only did we want to try to do the right thing as, as AAG, as a society, as we came here uh, as good guests, um, but we want to see if we can expand that to, to help encourage other academic societies to do this as well. How do we pay this forward? Uh, how can we give back in that way? And so I, I'm pleased to have uh, Keanu Kialahu here um, from Kanu, Hawaii. Um, the ancestral wisdom of, of Hawaii embraces an understanding that we are part of the environment, not above it. The life, lands, and waters are more than just our surroundings. So they are our family. Um, this rich bounty of resources is not inherited from our ancestors, 
uh, for exclusive enjoyment, uh, indeed, it's borrowed from them, and it's our responsibility uh, to preserve them for future generations. And Kanu Hawaii is a nonprofit organization dedicated to, to honor uh, th this is sacred trust by sharing these values and fostering behavior that is aligned with these goals by encouraging a pledge to our keiki, our children. Uh, Keone serves as executive director of Kanu Hawaii, and we are pleased, so pleased and honored uh, that he has joined us to share more about how we can support this movement. So I'd like to invite him up right now. All right, yeah, aloha kako. All right. Uh, my name is Keone Kealoha, and uh, I just wanted to thank you all for hosting your annual gathering here in Hawaii. It, it means a lot to have folks come to Hawaii. We do want folks to come to Hawaii, but we want them to do some things, you know, while they're here, they practice aloha, connect with the community, leave a positive impact when you're here, right? So, you know, I was talking with the uh, conference director, uh, Oscar uh, Larson, earlier, and I, I came to understand a little bit more about what geographers do, which I think a lot of people have a little bit of a misunderstanding. You're not cartographers, you're geographers, right? And at the biggest level, you folks, um, you folks study Honua, right? Honua is planet Earth. Uh, and beyond that, you, you look at the Aina and the Kama Aina, which is kind of the natural environment and the society or the people, right? People of the land. And then what I thought was most interesting and important is the, the interaction between people and place, right? And so modeling that while you travel and where you go is something that is a great thing to do. I also thought, what a cool job you have, you know? <laughs> um, but also what a big responsibility, you know? So uh, my name is Keone Kealoha. Uh, I work for Kana Hawaii. We're a local nonprofit, been around about 17 years, um, and we, the, the word kanu means to plant, right? And the, the genesis of kanu is, how do you plant yourself in Hawaii today to affect a positive future for tomorrow? And one of our initiatives uh, that we've undertaken is something called Pledge to Our Keiki. And uh, the pledge was written by students, by our youth, from different schools on different islands. And whether you live here or visit, it's, it's a call to take care of this place, right? To respect this place, it's their future, and it's the only home that we have. There's no other Hawaii's out there. And so they got together, they created this pledge through different processes, and um, we're at a point now where, you know, we've got an eight to one visitor ratio here, right? And a lot of folks come, and we've, unfortunately, you know, we've seen um, misuse and even abuse of the space uh, because everybody, you know, kind of wants to enjoy it. But I think what we want to get to today is, is doing something a little bit different. And that's our opportunity. So the cool thing is, is that this is the very first conference to adopt Pledge to Our Keiki. This is called the action from our, our kids, our students and youth across Hawaii. And we've come up with a couple of promises, whether you were aware of this or not, <laughs> that you're gonna help us keep by being here, right? And so these are a couple of them, right? We wanna get 100% participation in Pledge to Our Keiki. And that means, as you might have seen when you registered this morning, talking with some of our folks and, and uh, signing the pledge, right? You could either do it on the wall, upstairs on the fourth floor, or digitally. And so we're gonna measure that and we're gonna report back and see how close to 100% we can get. Hopefully we can get all the way there. I think the big thing about signing a pledge is that it, it doesn't do anything in and of itself, but it creates more awareness when you read that. And by signing it, our kids who are promoting this are gonna to start to see those numbers go up, that people actually care, right? It does mean something to them. And so I think we're also on for 25% uh, or a quarter of you to, to take an action, right? So the idea is not just to take the pledge, but to do something about it, actionize it. And the way we wanna do that is like, we can either take donation or we can have you volunteer. Fortunately, we do have the a landing page where you'll go and you can sign the pledge here, you can donate or volunteer, and we do have the largest volunteer management platform in Hawaii. We have right now uh, over 400 nonprofits hosting hundreds of events across every island. Uh, some of those are virtual, so you could do them from your hotel room or from other places. You don't necessarily have to be on the ground, but it's a great opportunity to get out there. This April is volunteer month, so 
we are the largest state level celebration of National Volunteer Month in the United States. So there's lots of chances to get out there and meet community. So, and this is how you do it. So you can use this QR code, puts you on your custom landing page. You can create one of these images, uh, just upload a picture and you can sign it on your phone and then you can instantly post it to social media of your choice. And you can tag the conference so we can see it, kind of get the word out there and let people know what you're supporting when you're in Hawaii. So we appreciate it. We know that you're gonna be here. We ask you to walk with aloha in your heart, take care of the places, be respectful. But we most appreciate that you're actually doing something very proactive that no one else has done before. No other conference has done this. No other group coming to Hawaii has done this at this scale before. So you're literally setting a precedent of how people in place can support each other. Mahalo. All right, thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, please do take the pledge. Let's live our values. And now I'm pleased to introduce AAG President, Dr. Rebecca Lave, uh, to introduce the honorary geographer. Welcome, Rebecca. Thank you, Gary. I'm gonna depart from script for a moment to just say how happy I am to see you all here. And you know, it's just such a special thing that we're all gathered here, so hooray for that. Um, so I am honored to introduce Charles Nanoa Thompson, this year's AAG Honorary Geographer. Charles Nanoa Thompson is a native Hawaiian navigator, educator, storyteller, and CEO of the Polynesian Voyaging Society. He is best known for his voyages across the Pacific Ocean in Hokulea, a traditional double-hauled canoe navigating by the stars and the wind and the waves. In 1980, he became the first native Hawaiian in 600 years to complete such a journey from Hawaii to Tahiti. Nanoa has earned worldwide acclaim uh, for his dedication to honing his knowledge of this navigation practice and inspiring a growing fleet of voyaging canoes. His contributions to reviving and teaching the skills of traditional instrumentless wayfinding have enabled this cherished cultural practice that once was on the brink of extinction to now flourish, not only in Hawaii, but across the Pacific Basin. The epic journeys of Hokulea and these other traditional ve vessels have reignited a dormant cultural practice and brought attention to the urgent need to better care for the ocean surface upon which they travel. Bodies of water that cover 70% of the Earth's surface and drive environmental systems that determine the livability of the planet and the quality of our lives. We are inspired by Nainoa's achie lifelong achievements and thrilled that he has agreed to accept this year's Honorary Geography Award and to offer today's keynote. So for all this and more, I am delighted to present Nainoa Thompson with the 2024 Honorary Geography Award, Honorary Geographer, excuse me. This award recognizes an exceptional leader in the arts, research, teaching, and writing whose work addresses geographic topics and making our world a better place. Aloha mai kako. Again, aloha. Um, I'm a better sailor than a public speaker, I promise. But um, I, I, I'm deeply honored to... Um, I guess be recognized, but not personally. I mean, there are thousands of people. There are hundreds of teachers. There's, there's infinite amount of volunteer work that, that keeps these canoes sailing across the whole Pacific. I'm just one of them. And so um, the acceptance of this particular gift is a recognition to, I would say, a Pacific movement rising up, standing up for what's right, and. Uh, for their beliefs and their values. And it's almost immeasurable to say how much it's done for identity. 
uh, about self-worth, about believing that we can get from underneath those who kind of compress us. And um, it's a new time, and, uh, and, and it's not just the canoe. I do want to thank uh, Keone and, uh, for being here and, and the genius of Kanu Hawaii. I do want to thank Kahu uh, Brutus for setting the stage and making the place ready to be able to receive thoughts. And I do want to thank Rebecca and, and, and Gary, the ones that have helped make this comfortable. I'm not a comfortable speaker, I promise you, but um, honored to be here on behalf of the voyaging family throughout the Pacific. <clears throat> and, uh, and just, um, I took a look at who you are. You're strangers to me, but the, the, the view of geography back when I was in school is dramatically changed in the 21st century. Because your work to many is probably the only inclusive, collective, expansive work that integrates the earth and humanity. And so we as navigators need to make choices, uh, but you gotta be informed. And um, let me just say this, because I wanna run out of time in this presentation. Um, when I think about, honestly, what I read, about what you believe in and what you're standing for, your sense of strength, that if we looked at the 21st century through the view of the crisis of everything, everything's wrong, um, then it needs navigators. But those navigators have to be able to see the scale of the issues from the whole global lens. And it has to deal with the fact that the Earth is going to restore itself. It has been doing that for billions of years. The question is us. It's a cultural issue. It's, a, it's an issue of values. It's an issue of, 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 of who's going to win the race between those who care and those who have greed. And um, the great navigators of our time in the, in the 21st century have got to come from that mental, broad, spatial, decision-making process of the geographer. That's what I think. And so I'm, again, honored to be here. I, got, I cut my slides down to 74, and I only got 25 minutes. <laughs> and um, and uh, so I'm going to go like really, really fast. And then you just, when I run out of time, just kick me out. I'm totally fine. And um, <laughs> um, next slide. Yeah. Imagine. Um, you're in, here in Hawaii, ne, and uh, you're on our soil. You're in our oceans. Imagine that we are, because somebody came here about 2,000 years ago, on a voyaging canoe. Best guess from the south. We don't know the name of the captain, navigator, or the canoe. That's kind of like forgetting Apollo. But there was reasons for the forgetting. 200 years ago, there'd be change. There'd be other voyagers who came here that brought gifts of disease and gifts of taking and, uh, and started to crush this native people. The, 100 years ago, the best guess median of, of um, the amount of native Hawaiians and the first European explorer came here was probably about 800,000. And then by, by 100 years ago, it reduced to 22,000. In 1926, um, Public schools would eliminate the ability by policy to speak your language, your culture, and tell someone your genealogy. 1926, my father was born. 1924, my father was born, near pure Hawaiian. And it would be his loving parents, my grandparents, that would choose to not teach him language, culture, and genealogy because if he tried to be who he was, my grandparents believed he'd get hurt. We were on a very slippery slope of um, extinction as a beautiful, beautiful contribution to the earth that you folks understand. And um, there needed to be something that would, that would be an idea, that would, that, would, would, that would change things about how we think, but it had to be bold. And, um, it had to be something that where people respected the effort of taking the risk 
to step up what's, for what's different. And it had to be different. And um, this is a story about our geographers on Arcanos. Um, and, um, and thank you for permitting me to speak about it. Um, <clears throat> next slide. It began with him, a uh, surfer in Santa Barbara that was uh, anthropologist and was confused by the information about how this exp exploring and dispersal of, of, of people across the biggest nation on the earth, Polynesia. And uh, the science didn't make sense, so he started to poke at it. The idea that came forward was in 1958, there was a woman professor at the University of Hawaii, and you can count women professors back then on one hand. Her na name was Catherine Luomala. She confronted this professor, Dr. Ben Finney, and, uh, and said, handed him two books. <clears throat> one book was called Tiki, and, she's, and uh, by Thor Heyerdahl, made movies, made books, in her opinion, was not accurate. And the other book was a book, of Voyaging Pacific People by, by a world-renowned anthropologist by the name of Andrew Sharp said, no, 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 they had canoes and they could kind of sail around, but they did not have the intelligence to navigate more than 100 miles. How do you account for Hawaii? The single most, if you accept ocean as an isolation, the single most isolated high island archipelago in the world, 2,300 miles from the islands in the south. And so it was storms that drifted them up there, statistically impossible. So Catherine Luomala handed Dr. Ben Finney the books and said, these, these books are wrong, change it. A decade later, 1968, next slide, there'd be a single phone call. I mean, Renaissance doesn't happen by big institutions. It doesn't happen by those who don't want change. Um, it was a single phone call from Santa Barbara to Chicago to this man, his name is Herb Kabainui Kane, Hawaiian, born in Hawaii, but he was an artist and he was practicing his trade in Chicago. Ben calls him and says, we need to find the truth. We need to be able to teach it. So these two men started to craft a dream that was founded on science and was founded on culture. And it became the only way that they believed that they could have <clears throat> the truth was actually to build a voyaging canoe, a deep sea voyaging canoe that have not been in Hawaii for 600 years. Next slide. This triangle is Polynesia. Hawaii is in the north. Uh, Aotearoa, New Zealand is in the southwest. And Rapa Nui, Easter Islands in the east. Uh, it's 10 million square miles, three and a half times bigger than continental United States, bigger than Russia and, and China combined. If you add on the other, and so if you add on Micronesia and, and Melanesia, it's 28 million squ square nautical miles. It's the biggest country by far on the planet. But no canoes, no navigators, except for one place. Next slide. <clears throat> this is an old photograph that was the day before the launching of this canoe, Hokulea. Hoko means star, Lea means gladness, the star of gladness. This was the dream of Ben and Herb made real because many, many people came in into the dream, pulled into the dream because it was what we say is porno. Way down deep inside, it, it's, it, it's righteous. It's the right thing to do. And uh, I was there and young and um, didn't know anything. Um, I came from a good high school that only had, my 13 years, only had half a semester of Hawaiian history that began at Kamehameha the first and ended in modern days. There was never a word that was ever spoken, ever. There was never a book on the shelf that said, Kaiki Nui, your homeland. There, 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 was never any, there was never any reason to value that, that um, I am a descendant of the greatest navigators on the face of the earth in their time. It, it was erased from the system. The black road has been well paved 
And we can look at how we pave those roads by what we teach our children. And um, <clears throat> I was there at this time in this epic moment. Um, it was confusing because Hawaiian things aren't leadership issues. Hawaiian things don't have value. But this canoe was so powerful in that you could feel in the community that there were those who would pray for this canoe and have no idea what it really means. There'd be those who didn't care because it's Hawaiian. Why would you care? And there was those who feared it, it would find Tahiti because it's going to change things. Sometimes we don't want change. And um, we launched a canoe. You should have been there. It was not a good day of sailing, let me promise you. We didn't know what we were doing. I, I have more time. I'd go into the stories, but I don't. But we, we were finding out how much we didn't know and how dangerous that is when you're not ready for the sea. Next slide. Miracle. Miracle. This man, he's um, master navigator, not Polynesian. The last Polynesian navigator was gone a while ago. He, by miracle, um, on his island had a Peace Corps worker by the name of Mike McCoy. When they were initially thinking about we navigate ourselves and not knowing how much we don't know and how dangerous that is, there was really a, a, a decision. That's what it's all about, decisions, to, 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 to find someone. Mike McCoy was the, um, he was a worker um, for the Peace Corps on the island of Satawa, where that island is called Woryang, powerful school of navigation. And this man, his name is, his name is Piailuk, but they call him Mao. Mao means to be fierce. He's a master navigator. And uh, by miracle, long story, Herb Connie talked to Mao in English. He could barely speak English. Asked him to sail a canoe that wasn't constructed on a voyage six times longer than any voyage Mao has ever made. That would be with the, he would be with a crew that wasn't selected. And that the, the canoe that he'd be on would be eight times bigger than his. And... Um, and uh, the story I was told, Mao listened to this, and uh, Mao said, yes, he'll do it. And so that fierceness, that courage that comes with him, it's more than that. Mao knew if he didn't come, that canoe would fail. And so, um, next slide. Here's his island, Satawal, Western Carolines. Mile long, half mile wide, high soil, eight feet. Um, having a really rough time in sea level rising right now. We need geographers there. We need engineers there to figure this out because we're losing the school, and the school is 4,000 years old in our lifetime. <clears throat> Next slide. I'll go quick. <laughs> I need some new slides. Um, uh, there's Hawaii way on the top of the screen, and then next slide. And there's Tahiti on the bottom of the screen, and that's that blue line that everybody said, yeah, just follow the blue line. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, if you go out today and go to um, Alamana Park and look south, um, to imagine the bearing of where Tahiti is, if you look at the east side and make an imaginary line on the west side, it's less than, it's near half degree on the compass. And he's going to navigate it just by nature. Stars, heavens, he's going to cross the two biggest consistent wind systems on the planet where they collide and um, the rainiest and cloudiest place in the world. Some call it doldrums. Some call it intertropical convergence zone. Uh, very difficult voyage. Next slide. But they went, 17 of them, um, uh, for this first voyage. This is the first voyage in 600 years. So, I mean, everybody credits with me, but I'm, it's not me. Um, next slide. Impact. I was selected for the trip back. Um, I was the youngest and the most afraid. Um, it's a long story of a lifetime journey between dreams and fear. And um, 
the arrival, I could not see the canoe because there were 17,000 Tahitians there. It's over half the population. Had to climb the monkey padre. And uh, then so many children jumped on this canoe because in their genealogy, their language, they know the names of the captains and the navigators. They know the famous canoes. They know the roads on the ocean. And the road between Hawaii and Tahiti is a very important road called Kiala Ikahiki, the pathway to Kahiki Nui, pathway to our homeland. And so this was their canoe because they didn't have a canoe. It became theirs. So much children jumped on it. On the back, we had to politely in English to tell them to get off because they were kind of sinking the canoe. But it was, um, it changed everything. Because all of a sudden, we are in the family. The family of Kaikinui, ancestral. We're finding the same names. My father's name is Paoa. And that is a genealogy of great navigators. And, uh, and these connections were happening across Tahiti and um, there are many, many changes. I'll leave you with one. The, the big issue that needed to be changed was what we teach our children in education. At the time of the, of, of the best guess, at the time of Hokulea being launched, there were less than 100 fluent native Hawaiian speakers, all elders. Today, there's 22,500. Yeah. And they're young and they're courageous. Hawaiians become the first language in Hawaii again. And um, no school in Hawaii will survive unless it pays respect to the people of this place. Next slide. I'll probably get on about 15 slides now before 74, yeah? <coughs> uh, next slide. Are we going backwards? Oh, okay. So, um, okay, I'm kind of a little bit lost. Uh, Mao finds Tahiti real quick. He comes back for 28 years and takes us by the hand like children, pulls us through the window of time into the old ocean. Nobody else could have done it. And uh, he came back, and uh, it's a long story, but for the first voyage, we were in immersion, ocean immersion, 28 months every day. If I didn't touch salt water with him, he'd make me swim in the black, in the rough, uh, outside of our cliffs just to start to be able to not be afraid of what you can't see underneath you in the deep. Next slide. And then we sailed to Tahiti and back. <clears throat> he came on board. And then for the next 28 years, he's been our mentor and, and our teacher. And uh, um, one thing about Mao is that um, we learned everything by watching him. And uh, he, he didn't have a syllabus or a textbook, but he... Uh, Watching him, we, we knew how to stand. We knew what to look at. We knew how to, how to rest. We knew and how to find sleep without sleeping, how to get rest without sleeping. Because you only know where you are by memorizing where you come from. And um, so you start with where you're leaving and memorize that for a month. And there you make, he makes like 5,000 observations of nature a day. He makes 500 choices, that number. Turn the canoe left or right, and then he makes two decisions at sunrise and sunset. The most important time of the navigator is sunrise and sunset, where you're predicting the weather for the next day <clears throat> and, uh, or the next night. And um, I've always thought about these 500 choices that he has to make, and they got to be right. What if you multiplied that against 8 billion people? So it would be 4 trillion human choices a day. What if we made good ones? That's what geographers do. They help us be honest about what's right because they see the whole thing, the whole scale. Next slide. <clears throat> yeah, then, then, you know, Herb and Ben gave us the canoe. Mao showed us the way. Next slide. And we sailed far. We, we did 13 voyages across the Pacific. Um, um, and I do know that triangle represents our, um, we call it Polynesia, but if you're going to trace language, Austronesian language, you got to go to Chile, and you got to go behind this screen to a place called Madagascar, 16 time zones that they had traveled. Next slide. <clears throat> the other navigator, I mean, the other navigator, but the also the other geographer that had a huge impact on my life and uh, um, was a person inspired by this photograph, Earthrise. 
Uh, in Apollo 8, 1968, William Anders took this photograph, first one of, of the island, of the Blue Island. And um, next slide. Yeah. Best friend. Lieutenant Colonel Lacey Beach, Keikyo Aina, he's Ku Aina, he's from this land. Second astronaut to space from Hawaii after um, Ellison Onizuka. He, I wish we had time, but um, fighter pilot in Vietnam. Um, he loved, he loved flying. But the reason he went into the shuttle program was because he wanted to get, get to go so fast that he can get outside of the gravitational force to pull us back in there and get into orbit. And so he wanted to get into orbit, turn around, and look at the island, the whole island, like geographers do, and have to. And he would talk about, I need to get up there so I can see the whole island, so I can see the whole systems, the magical, complex systems of this earth, both geographic, both physical, ecological, and human. And, 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 and he would talk about that intersection about humanity and the earth and the changes of choices we have to make. And, and he, next slide. <clears throat> he flew the shuttle program. Next slide. He loved Tokoleo. Um, yeah. First day I met him on the canoe, we were taking him sailing. Long story, but first time. And everybody was like so intimidated by him that... Uh, yeah, he's doing a presentation uh, for his high school and a and, and huge crowd, and he showed videos of Columbia and he um, standing ovation. He goes, I was there, and he goes back into the white. He has his white tuxedo with a black tie on, and he goes into this like five door limousine. They got shouldn't even be on a road, but um, <laughs> off he goes. Next morning, we're training for, for a trip to Rarotonga, and. Um, I get a phone call from the governor's office. The governor's office never calls me. And, um, and, um, and says, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Lacey Beach wants to go sailing with you today. And so <laughs> I, was, I was traumatized. And so um, <laughs> I tell him, come down at 9 o'clock, knowing that my crew is going to come down at 8. So I get to the pier, so old pier in Honolulu Harbor, sit down with the crew and tell them, hey, my hero's coming today. You guys... Put on some slippers and maybe uh, a T-shirt and then <laughs> and try your best to speak the best English you can find. And then he, uh, here comes Lacey and his mother's, true story, rusted DeSoto. And he gets out of the car. There's no black tie. There was no, tu there was no tuxedo. It was, he was barefoot, ripped shorts, and no T-shirt. And, uh, <laughs> and we were intimidated. Nobody knew how to greet him. He got on the canoe and you kind of do that uncomfortable moment where we're not connecting. And uh, he started rubbing the wood in Hokulea. And then he said to us, thank you, thank you, thank you. Because today, today I'm going to understand the real power of expiration. Thank you for letting me come in Hokulea. Bam. For me, it was, this is going to be best friend. And um, next slide. Yeah, in 92, he um, smuggled this. If you look in this, uh, uh, Columbia's, uh, uh, Columbia's uh, window, you see the island of Hawaii. And if you can look in kind of the center high part, the tiny red dot, Kianaka Ko'i, 12,500 foot elevation. Native Hawaiians, there was a glacier about 35,000 years ago. The volcano erupted, cooled it, very dense rock. The best stone to make the tools to carve canoes, the ads. His grandfather got that to him. He smuggled it on Columbia. Um, and he said, I got, a present. I got a present for you. But it was insight into his concern that we're messing with the earth systems. And uh, this is early where nobody really, climate change wasn't a word. I mean, sustainability was nobody talked about it. It was different then. And nobody talked about the oceans. And... Uh, so he was forecasting tomorrow. And um, he said, but here's a solution. We look, the ads represents looking 500 years back and looking at the, the genius of our native people who lived in sustainable ways on these islands in the first place. And then we look at the power of technology and 
If it's navigated by the right values, we can change the world. Next slide. We would go once a year, we'd pick a day, I meet him in Hilo, island of Hawaii, we'd rent a car and illegally drive it up to that black lava on, on the northern side of uh, Mauna Loa, get on the black lava so it absorbs all light, bring stars close. And we would talk about exploration, we talk about how do we bring our vehicles together to inspire young people to explore. Next slide. And when it would get to the earth, when we would talk about the earth, um, there'd be that really uncomfortable moment when he would um, get so angry at what, what we're doing to it. And, um, and uh, he would get enraged. I'd have to physically hold him and calm him down He's like the most optimistic person I knew, but he did not have the solution and the equation for a safe future in, in the early 90s. Next slide. It's, the story's too long, but on his next flight on, on shuttle, he, his partner, Bill Shepard, um, became the commander of, of opening up the International Space Station in the year 2000. Um, Lacey was sleeping on Velcro against the wall, and um, Bill Shepard scrapes him off the wall, breaking protocol, knowing that the Hawaiian Islands are going to come up in the light of the dawn, of the shuttle dawn. Floats him to the window, takes off his goggles, and Bill tells a story that, that um, Lacey looked down and goes, that's my home. And this is where we're going to save the earth. Because here we can figure out anything, energy, food, all the answers. All the answers were here already. But in the end, what Lacey said to me, he said, yeah, we can figure out all those technological issues. But the thing we need to figure out is, is the culture of humanity kind enough to make the changes it needs to make? That's why geography is so key. He's trying to tap into what is the culture of the earth and uh, of humanity. Next slide. I'm going to go quick. And, um, and so he kept telling me, you can't protect what you don't understand. And we won't if you don't care. You can't do it by yourself. Take Hokulea around the world. He plants the seed of the voyage called Malama uh, Honua. That means to care for the earth. And he kept bugging me about this, and, and, he, um, and he said, you know, you can't protect what you don't understand. You need to go. This canoe needs to feel the earth, be with the earth, and the earth needs to be with the canoe, take it around the world. Beautiful dream, but within our scope of what we could believe in, it was too big. It was too hard. It was too dangerous. Next slide. <clears throat> 1995, late September, I get a call from Houston from his wife. It says, you got to come today. Get on a plane tonight. Lacey was battling a lymphomelanoma, and he was losing. And um, I flew up and went into their dark house with 100 people there, strangers. I didn't know them. They didn't know me. Uh, couldn't find Lacey, and um, I went to Alice, his wife said, where is he? He goes, he's in the bedroom waiting for you. So I go in, and, and he tells me, don't worry about this, I'm going to get over it. Um, in a wheelchair with too much fluid, and couldn't walk, and um, he said, but, I know right now, you make me three promises. He said, you pay attention to the new language on the earth. Climate, sustainability, hypoxia, dead zones, carbon. You pay attention to that language. It's going to help you with what you need to do. Then he said, promise me you'll sail this canoe around the world. Promise me. And then he said, Promise me you'll build a school for the earth, by the earth. Bam. That's what you do. That's what geographers do in my mind. 
And without that school, our chances of a future that's going to be good enough for our kids is going to heavily diminish. Think about what I was trained in school. Infinite, vast, take all you want, no need to get back. Wrong. Next slide. Once a year, the Voyaging family would get together somewhere. 13 years, we would get together and um, after Lacey died. We lost a star, man. But we remember the promises. We'd get together, set the agenda, and every time it'd come up, what about going around the world? You made promises, Nainoa. And we would say, yeah, let's go. And then we'd go, someone would raise a hand, but what about the pirate? What about the hurricane? What about the rogue wave of South Africa? What about the disease everywhere? We're going to be on land, four, we'll be at sea 450 days in a land, foreign soil, 950 days with a crew of 30. And every time we listen at the, at, at, at the fear that comes out of us, that little person inside of me will step out and you'll say, no. We'd vote, and we'd vote it down 13 years. The 14th year, it was April 1st. And um, 2008, the problem with the vote, we weren't asking the right vote. The problem was not the issue of whether we can go around the world. The issue is what's more dangerous, the pirate or the hurricane or the disease or staying tied to the dock and do nothing? What's more dangerous? And that point we said, okay. All the fear came out of me, but there are guys looking at me like, you made a promise, man. And they were ready to go. I wasn't. We took six years to train. Next slide. Yep. Young people believing in something. Redoing this whole canoe called Hokulea. The whole canoe took six years. Next. And we trained hard. We trained them hard. And, uh, because if you're going to do something at that level, you better be excellent. Next slide. Built another canoe in New Zealand called Hikianalia. It was our science boat, our communication boat, our medical boat, all these things to allow Hokulea to sail free. Next slide. And we brought crew members from around the Pacific. Next slide. I don't know how much time. You guys can kick me off anytime you... I passed my time. Four minutes? Okay. <clears throat> we sailed around the world, um, and uh, we came home. And it was a voyage of exploration. It was a voyage of connection. It was about touching the world and touching the world's people. And we gained a lot. But one thing we learned was that the most impl- important place in the world is the oceans. If ecology wants to exist the way we have, if, if, if the chemistry of our atmosphere, if, if, if the food systems are, are going to be intact, you have to protect the oceans. We're now on a voyage called Moana Nui Akea. And it's, um, it's a longer, it's, it's, it's circumnavigating the, um, the, the Pacific. And interesting that the Pacific has more salt water than all the other oceans combined. The Pacific takes up one third the surface of the earth. You can fit all land, all dirt into the Pacific. And therefore, the, the, the circumnavigation is longer than going around the world. And it's probably the most dangerous because we are finding that we have less confidence in forecasting anymore uh, because the ocean's hot. And we're really concerned about the areas of South China Sea, Taiwan, China, and other places. And uh, we have just completed this year from Alaska to San Diego. We were supposed to go, uh, we should be actually in South America right now, but San Diego, we got a phone call from Lahaina. I know we're in the black of the storm and we don't know how to get out. Hokole is a light. Can you bring it home? So we did. 
and we were there for the communion, we still are, and we're going to stay home because there's so much uncertainty about what's happening because we don't understand enough about the earth and its systems. Add heat to the ocean, what does it do? And, um, and, um, and the need for humanity to really do, decide what its choices are going to be by its values. And um, so we're taking one year now to go to 26 ports here in Hawaii to 34 different communities based on the geography of where our, our big public schools are. And we've have, we have a commitment of 300 teachers to come and develop learning about having children be navigators for their own life, their own destinations, their own values, and making sure that we start to talk about the importance of the earth systems. That's why you're important. I will end this presentation there. Um, all I want to say is that, you know, Mao, he was ch chosen by his grandfather at age one. He would play in tide pools on South the Wall. Because when I, when, when I did the trip down to Tahiti and came back, he sat me down and said, you did okay. But if you want to know the magic, you're too old. Because I'm not connected enough to nature because I started training too late. And um, he talked about the one-year-old tide pool. So he can hear a bird. He can taste salt. He can feel sand. He can listen to the forest. And age five, he was voyaging on, on his grandfather's voyaging canoe. And you say, when the wave comes, the, the wave makes the canoe go up and down. And when the canoe go up and down, it make me sick. So my grandfather tied my hands and throw me overboard <laughs> and drag me behind the canoe. You know, try that on the public school system. Uh, <laughs> yeah. and, and, but he always had this great love for his grandfather's uh, love for him. He said, yeah, my grandfather throw me in the ocean so I can go inside the ocean. When I go inside the ocean, I can go in the wave. The same way the wave makes me sick. I can go inside the wave. When I go inside the wave, I become the wave. And when I become the wave, I'm navigator. Bam, because there's no difference between nature and humanity at that moment. It's the same thing. And so he becomes a geographer for us. I mean, he, he doesn't have a computer. He doesn't have a filing cabinet. It's all in his head. I watch him and his brother. His brother, Mouse, is better than him. He's younger than him, Urupa, who's blind. They clear, the, they, they clear the canoe house. They put one chair in each of the corners of the canoe house. And these two guys, 30 hours. 30 hours of, of a geographic lesson that was all in their heads. And they would say, the parrotfish comes out, goes over here. They put the stick in the hole. The parrotfish goes up to this reef. The parrotfish goes to that island. And the parrotfish goes to islands that actually don't exist. It's called ATAC. But that is the understanding of the, of, of the geographer when it's all in his mind. And, uh, and the other one is Lacey. And uh, Lacey is our guiding force about, about earth systems, about, about you gotta know the systems. And, and, um, and, and so all I wanna say is um, 21st century fast needs navigators, great navigators, that are dealing with the complex issues of a complex earth and the relationship of humanity to that earth. We need these navigators to be able to forecast tomorrow. What is the weather forecast going to look like in 2050 if we don't do anything? Are we just going to measure the burning of the earth? I think, and I say this because of the place I've been. I think geographers are the most important navigators in the 21st century that can help us shape and forecast and allow humanity to figure out, to put the responsibility on them, how are they gonna make the choices? What are gonna be the values? I think geographers are so important because of that inner relationship of the island of the island Earth, the only one we have in the vast ocean of space. That island is the only one we have, and we have a chance 
but it's going to need those navigators to help us show the way. That is why I'm very, very, on behalf of my family, the Voyaging family, I'm really honored to be here, and, um, and we need you, and, great, and we're very grateful to all of you. Mahalo. <clears throat> I know, I know. I know. I speak for all of us when I say we are honored to, that you share your energy, your journey with us. Um, thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. And I know a Thompson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.